Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. I'm the Chess Nerd and today we're going to be looking at a very special game played in the Zurich International Chess Tournament of 1953. Our two contestants are uh, Yui Averback with the white pieces here and Alexander Kodov with the black pieces. Let me just tell you, this is a very beautiful game. It won a brilliancy prize. It's, it's up there to be one of the best chess games ever played. So today I'm going to show it to you and hopefully you like it. This game is part of an integral series in which I analyze every game of the Zurich International Chess Tournament on my Instagram page at the Chess Nerd. Uh, click the link down below if you want to follow uh, the journey. So today we dive into a to what seems to be a regular game. Um, the pawn structure seems sort of equal and the pieces also um, not no uh, no big advantages for now white has a a little space advantage with a upper pawn structure but it's not a huge advantage moreover you have black who who has a, a bit less space right only has three uh, three columns of space and doesn't have much space, but he's looking to push f4 and maybe uh, attack the king. So we come here in a normal position in which uh, white try to double up their rooks maybe, take advantage of the g-file here. And white plays rook g2. And after this move, black take advantage of the lead that white just uh, led to him. And he pushes pawn f4. This is good for two reasons. First, it gains a tempo on the bishop, who is, which is now bad unless it gets in front of the pawn structure. But for now, it's intimidated and be behind the pawn structure of black. So it's a bad bishop, also known as a mole. Um, yeah, those are the two reasons. So it gains a tempo and the bishop is bad now. So the bishop folds back to f2. And after that, uh, black simply prepares uh, for an attack, maybe slide the rook on h6, um, preparing anything, anything really. And after rook f6, white folds back his knight, so knight e2. And now for this move, Alexander Kodov took a lot of time on his clock um, thinking of a potential sacrifice, so queen takes h3. And it seems tempting. Uh, after king takes h3, the king is kind of in the open, and we don't know what happens. Alexander Karov thinks, 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 and finally he plays the majestical move. Queen takes h3. Double exclamation point. So what is Alexander Karov's goal with this sacrifice? So after king takes h3, um, Alexander Karov judges that after rook h6 check, the king easily goes to g4, has to, and will probably go to f5, f5 next. So um, Alexander Kodov's get, his goal is to bring white's king to f5. Once his king is in f5, Kodov can prepare a mating net in which he can induce the king or the white pieces to sacrifice much material to avoid a mating, a mating net in which black would force a meeting net so that's what alexander kodov was thinking about uh in the in that hour that he took for that move look this is why he took an hour the sacrifice itself is a big one so it's a game changer so if this sacrifice does not work alexander kodov can officially resign anytime and he's not sure whether or not this works so in his mind, while he's calculating, he's thinking, okay, I'll play rook h6 check, any king has to go to g4, and after I play knight f6 check, uh, the king has to go to f5. So that's set and done. And from here, he has to calculate a move that doesn't do, ch that, that, that prepares checkmate or threatens checkmate, but it's not a direct threat. So that's what's hard about calculating these types of lines when it's such a major sacrifice like queen takes h3. So that really shows the beauty of how Alexander Kodov really designed um, his destiny in this game.
So after these moves, which were actually, which were actually played, uh, note that black has like no direct mate, like the king is threatening to go to e6. And because of this threat of king to e6, um, it explains black's next move. So black plays knight d7. That covers the e6 square with the black rook. Um, a little thing that's showing now because of Alexander Kodov's uh, long calculation is that he didn't, 97 isn't the perfect move. In fact, there is better than 97. Alexander Kodov could have played knight g4, which is a very interesting variation. So knight g4, white can't play f takes because of Rook F8 checkmate. And th that's the, the actual threat. So so if king takes knight, rook g8, king f5 forced, and rook f6 checkmate. So yeah, that's the actual threat. So rook f6, uh, rook f8, king takes g4, and rook g8 check. King goes back, and then rook f6 checkmate so that's the threat of a better knight g4 and this forces white to give up a lot of material actually so first knight takes um, f4 and after black threatens checkmate on f6 here with rook g8 white has to give up his knight for free so knight h5 pre preventing checkmate here on f6 And so after it takes, oh, after a calm rook g6, that threatens mate here in two moves. Um, white have to give up their queen, so queen g5, very tempting. So black accepts the sacrifice with bishop takes g5. And this would have been like very winning very easily. And after king takes g4, then a simple bishop f4 check. King h3, rook takes rook, knight takes bishop, pawn takes f4, and here white are completely lost. Um, his bishop is super bad, and is training on a very weak and passive rook that has no activity, right? So yeah, white is completely losing, and this game would have finished way, way uh, quicker. But Alexander Kodov decides to give his opponent Yuri Averbach a chance and plays knight d7 and plays knight d7 which is still winning here Yuri Averbach needs to think of a clever way to avoid being checkmated Because here, black threatened mate in three, which is rook f8 check. And after, say white plays a3 in blunder, uh, black have rook, a, rook f8 check. And after king g4 forced, rook g8 check. And after king f5 forced, then rook f6 checkmate, right? So white can't do anything, can't do just anything here. And he has to like find a proper solution to win or to give advantage or to give material but not, not enough material to lose. So he, he comes up with a clever rook g5 here. And the idea of rook g5 is that once black play rook f8, white can shelter his king to g4 and there is no second check here. So that's what uh, Yuri Averbach played. And Kotov still thinks indeed is winning. He is winning, and he comes up with rook f8 check, king g4, and then knight f6 check. And after king f5, which is four still, Kotov looks at his position and looks at his time, and he says, "Oh my God, I have one minute left, or two minutes, or five minutes. Not enough time, you know." 
So he doesn't have enough time left and he thinks quick on his feet and he thinks of a perpetual that a perpetual that doesn't give a three-fold repetition draw. Instead he just does two folds, so he does check here. This is all gaining him time while he's doing it too. And now check again. And now check. And now because there's a pawn less on the board, he can do that repetition that repetition two two times more to g8 without being a three fold a three fold repetition because it's not th the same position theoretically speaking. So could have gained probably I would like to say uh, five minutes off here, and not only that, after knight f6 check here. After knight f6 check here, black has just entered the 40th move of the game. And in this tournament, there is a special rule called game adjournment, which means after 40 moves played by both opponents, both opponents pause the game and the game resumes the next day. So grandmasters that play in that game, have their game paused, can analyze that game said game that's still um, in play, theoretically speaking, till the next morning, all night. So they analyze their game all night to see if anything is winning. And this is exactly what Alexander Kadov applies in his technique. So he, he commits to perpetual checks to his opponent and until the 40th move, which just happened now. And we can say that right here, the game paused in 1953. Alexander Kodov went back to his hotel room and analyzed this game all night long and found a winning combination. So after knight f6 check, we resume to the 42nd move. White play, king f5. And after knight g8 check, white play, king g4. And, f and now black need to play something else than knight f6, otherwise it's a three-fold repetition. If he would have played knight f6 here, Alexander Kodov, if he would have played knight f6, this is a three-fold three rep repetition draw, and it would have been draw on the board immediately. And that would have shown that Alexander Kodov did not come up with something conclusive the night before when he was analyzing the game. But he found something, and he plays the magical bishop takes rook on g5. This is what black threatens if white don't take back. So if white don't take the bishop back, black threatens, say he plays a3 again, a blunder. Black plays, knight, black threatens bishop e7, which threatens, okay, let's say another dumb move, a4, which threatens knight f6 check. And after king f5, knight d7, king g4, Rook g8, king f5, and rook f6, it would have been mate. So that's what he's threatening, long term. But we both see that uh, he's far from that. But after bishop takes g5, uh, white play, king takes g5. He won't just let black walk away with a free rook like that. So anyways, after king takes g5, black threatened black threaten maiden 2 with the clever rook f7. And rook f7 threatens rook g7 check, king f king f5, and rook f6 checkmate, right? An obvious made in two moves. And if white try to avoid that and play knight takes f4, then rook g7 check, and after knight g6 check, rook g takes g6 check, king f5, and now knight d7. So both knight f4 and anything else that's bad, so the obvious a, a4, a3, or b3, b4, um, all of that loses on the spot. So white, once again, has to be careful and defend well. And by defend well, I mean sacrifice some more material. So after rook f7, bishop h4, and now 
rook h6 g6 check now after king h5 rook f7 g7 and this threatens mate on it on h6 so white has to do something about it once again so black threatens mate on one and white doesn't have many resources so he decides to give a full bishop here which is uh, quite forced um, to prevent the mate on h6 so after bishop g5 rook takes g5 check king h4 black threatens mate in one again with uh, knight f6 this time threatening mate on h5 with his rook and after knight g3 here which prevents checkmate in one again giving uh, material um, black play rook takes g3 and black here although it's still a knight and a rook against a queen which is theoretically still good for white so white is winning black have a much more superior position as he threatens rook g6 and the calm rook h6 checkmate which is very very hard to defend i mean why well, have to get a piece in front here or distract the the black pieces uh, in the center here by taking anything to distract from rook g6 and rook h6 checkmate threat so white respond with force queen takes d6 and now after rook g6 threatening checkmate once again white have to sacrifice it's just it's it's not even an option so queen b8 check and after rook g8 here yuri Averback resigned with the white pieces because mate or sacrifice of the queen is inevitable is inevitable inevitable here so yeah this is how alexander konov managed to sacrifice a full queen against a pawn on h3 and still came up with a glorious win here with the black pieces i hope you enjoyed this video and if you want more content like this follow my instagram page you never know you may like uh, the pictures and videos i post there uh, of my chess collection and of the games i'm analyzing in this 210 game uh, zurich international chess tournament so i hope you like the video and have the best day possible.